The next speaker is James Pond Cramplin. The title is Lotte, Ta Lotte World Tower, Vertical Meets Horizontal. James Pond Cramplin is a design principal at Con Peterson Parks in New York, where he has practiced architecture since 1984. His work includes Praja 66 in Shanghai, China, Central Police in Beijing, Donggu Financial Center in Seoul, and then the core building of new Songdo city in Incheon. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Now, of course, the, uh, here you see an image of a model which is uh, actually sitting out in, in a booth outside uh, the hall. It's a sort of minimal sculpted form of this 123-story structure that Sautine and Les have described the, uh, the underpinnings of. What is unusual about the project is really that it's being built. Uh, and I hope that some of you will be able to go to the site tour this afternoon around 2 o'clock because the magnitude of the site and, and just the fact that this thing is moving forward quickly now after what some of you may understand is uh, many, many years in the gestation. Uh, Cohen Patterson Fox is not the first architect to come to the project. We stand on the shoulders of uh, a number of other firms, including RTKL, Skidmore Owings in Merrill, and others who, with the Lotte uh, client, have brought the project forward. So we're fortunate to be here, in a way, towards the end of the project, along with our colleagues, Baum Architects, here in Seoul. So here you see the excavation, the site preparation, uh, starting in 2010, and uh, then the, the structure surrounding the pouring of the mat, which I'm told the mat foundation took something like 5,000 uh, trucks of concrete. So I suppose if you line them up, they'd probably, uh, I don't know how far they would stretch, but it's, it, the, the magnitude of it all is incredible. What I want to talk about today, though, uh, from the point of view of the architect, working with my colleagues, my partner Trent Tesh, my partner Richard Nemeth, uh, from the New York office of KPF, is the urban surrounding, the urban habitat of this project. Uh, so here you see it in, in its uh, sort of isolated form, or uh, it seems isolated given the scale of the neighborhood around it. But this is the sort of setting which we imagine uh, this kind of group is gathered together to talk about. Uh, Hyper-dense settings where tall buildings can link together to make the kind of environment that is efficient from the point of view of transport, that sponsors the development of ideas and uh, commerce in a way that we all kind of uh, enjoy. It gives us a buzz. That's why we're all tall building people. Well, this image is actually London compressed. So uh, it, it tells you something about density and uh, the sort of visual impact that we're used to in downtown Hong Kong, downtown New York, et cetera. And we can look at the same uh, kind of compression of Seoul and imagine other than the sort of tall mountains, the kind of building densities uh, occurring greater than uh, they do occur today in areas like Jamshil, where the Lotte Tower is sited. Um, so we see the, the view of the Han River today. Uh, in fact, Seoul is quite a bit smaller in its geographical reach than London and has quite a bit larger population. And so the demands of density are great. The opportunities to build uh, close together and tall are, are uh, serious at this point. And if we think about the sort of topographic uh, and the, the, uh, the skyline profile of, of Seoul and compare it, for example, to uh, 18th century London, where the spires of the churches of Wren and others gave us a kind of locus for the concentration of neighborhood clusters, we can think of the same phenomenon in Seoul. And in fact, between towers that will be erected in uh, Samangdong, in Yongsan, uh, by Hyundai, by Lotte, and others, this kind of marking of centers in a, a city which is quite otherwise widely spread is happening. And you see the relationship of these tall structures closing in on 500 meters or taller along the Han River and then stretching out to what is today Korea's tallest building in Songdo. 
So here you see the site. This is a, a little uh, a bit of an old photograph, but uh, it shows you still the site as cleared, sitting just south of the Han River. And, uh, and again, the rendering of this 555 meter tower. Now, we tend to think of tall buildings uh, in great part above grade, because that's in a way what's remarkable about them, at least uh, on first sight. But it's really, from an urbanistic point of view, it's what happens at grade, slightly below grade. It's the connections to infrastructure, the connections to programmatic diversity in the surrounding neighborhood that make the design of the tall building a, the greatest challenge, I think, for the architect and, and those working with the architect. So this kind of root ball, if you will, of the building, uh, and it's, it's first four or five stories below grade, four or five stories above grade, it's, it's what we want to talk about right now. This is an idealized image, a kind of abstracted image, if you, one were to study uh, the transport hubs of, for example, Grand Central Station. Uh, the coming together of uh, rail, of uh, metro, of cars, uh, with vertical cores, streets, etc. How can this matrix be most efficiently designed? Tremendous pressure uh, is placed on the areas that are available, which are quite small, to design for the populations which will go into this building, which, considering the use of a base together with a tower, might be up to 10, 20, even 30,000 people. And this kind of density is something which uh, many of, of us architects working in center cities in Asian contexts have been wrestling with. This is uh, an image of, uh, actually on, on the left side, a built project which KPF uh, worked with Japan Railways on about 10 years ago. On the right side, the second phase of the same project. So it is a vertically stacked, plug and play, uh, diverse set of functions. And so the key to the project, if there has been one from a planning point of view, has been the multiple iterations of studies and comparisons looking at traffic, structure, foundation issues, retail merchandising, tower design uh, at these lower levels, how to get cars and people, goods and services together. And the, the Lotte Tower relies on four critical levels to get people into, at least in the tower, about 48 uh, total elevators, many of which are double-decker elevators, and you could throw in another uh, 30 or 40 elevators for the low-rise section. So um, it's an incredible coordination of uh, circulation systems. Those double-deckers are used for the observation decks <coughs> accessed from the B2 and B1 levels, so you have a couple of levels below grade then uh, hotel residential levels at the B1 level, and then the office levels, ground and mezzanine. So with the double-deckers, of course, this kind of uh, slight splitting of the ground plane into uh, multiple ground planes, if you will, uh, is the strategy. So as we think about the way that a high-rise root ball and tower and podium come together, and the way in which we will hope to think about the use of the space, we can compare this to the use of a city. If we think of the tower as a vertical city and its podium as the horizontal extension. So uh, again, to use London as a paradigm, we can imagine, uh, and this is looking along um, uh, Regent Street, uh, surrounding Regent Street, a uh, series of smaller London squares. Uh, within the Lotte Tower, there will be a series of spaces that are publicly accessible, not only for tenants, not only for users and those who pay uh, a lease or for the use of a hotel room or an apartment, but for those who go to visit or to use uh, restaurants and so on. So those red blobs that, that populate their, the, the tower vertically and the podium have an influence on all of the surrounding spaces of uh, more repetitive areas because there is something in the psychology of the user of the tower to think, I don't have to go down to the base of the tower to have my lunch or meet a friend, uh, but to be able to occupy upper levels, um, and that's the goal of the tower. So um, horizontally, uh, we've looked at, and of course our client, uh, Lotte, has looked very carefully at what is in the neighborhood already. Uh, what in the way of uh, residential, retail, entertainment, working, living, playing, et cetera, uh, 
uh, is to be found. And those very elements are then borrowed in a way and put into the tower from recreation to an aquarium, a jazz bar, retail, concert hall. There are public cultural functions that are placed in this podium. Plenty of movie theaters, lots of restaurants, a big department store, which is one of Lotte's strengths. But then when we get to the tower, this is comparing on the right-hand side the Lotte section with a couple of other towers that KPF has built uh, in China and Hong Kong, which we think of as mixed-use towers. In fact, the Lotte Tower is probably the most highly inflected, varied program of a high-rise tower that we can think of. Uh, it is not just office or office and residential or office, residential, and hotel. So now to go to that stacking, a duty-free area above the, the uh, lobbies, banquet halls, a healthcare area for, for uh, clinics, uh, conference areas that are for office users, then plenty of office space, more conference as a kind of sky garden up at, the, let's say, the 30th floor, more office, then up to office tell, which is a kind of a, a service department, uh, then a lobby and a six-star Lotte Hotel. Lotte is very well known for their, their uh, high, high-end hotel product. Uh, then VIP restaurants, VIP office, gallery, and observation deck. So. If you look at that as a kind of core sample, varied strata, uh, it's complementing the variety of the base is what makes this a kind of integrated vertical and horizontal uh, design. And especially the cultural component. The fact that there will be a museum and a world-class concert hall with seating for 2,000 people that will be on, on a par or above the performance of Lincoln Center or Suntory Hall, you know, those who make musical recordings are, are being brought to make sure this is the finest. And this is early stage uh, study of a section of the base showing tower and, and uh, retail together. Since then, actually, the concert halls come into the mix. But the, the movement of people, not just vertically and horizontally, but diagonally through these kind of escalator halls and caverns, uh, I mean, it's something that I think evokes a sense of kind of uh, almost of a, a Roman scale of thinking about uh, the city, the, the, the large chambers of space. If you think of the, the Baths of Caracalla. And uh, so we see here the dynamic of various of these program elements uh, balancing each other. Then the circulation, that's most important, of uh, bus and taxi going underneath this thing. There's also a metro line that swings very close to the influence of the foundation of the building, which I'm sure Sautine and Les could talk about for another few hours. That's fascinating. Um, and then uh, cars below uh, with, of course, a lot of parking. Tapping into cores, going to these various zones, which are thought of in kind of a demographic striation of different age groups and different price points, different different portions of population, and then uh, sub uh, cores for parking, and then a sky street, so that up at the top of the retail, ninth or 10th floor, there will be a zone where one can move back and forth between uh, concert, tower, uh, residence, et cetera, without having go to go down to the ground. Uh, and then, of course, the office and, and uh, other many other function tower elevators that tap in to this whole amalgam of the base um, with shuttle elevators going up to the residential and hotel and observation. And that all comes together in a site plan, which we won't go into today, but for which there are huge priorities of public space, gathering outdoors. Think of Rockefeller Center as a sort of a generating idea. Now, the exterior of the building belies all of this uh, smorgasbord of 18 different functions because it, it is brought together in a very, very coherent, simple, as simple as possible form. Now we know, uh, and so we show this hull of a boat, because a ship builder or a boat builder has spars of wood and a few cross sections, and, and otherwise it's a very simple form, because it has to, has to go very smoothly through the water. But inside that uh, very simple bottle-like form, which tapers according to the program, there are, so to speak, carved a series of these public spaces that I mentioned earlier. So it's a little bit like the way a carpenter would cut with a lathe uh, a section through a table leg or the way a candlestick maker might think of the form of the edge of, uh, of that brass form. So at each of these levels, there is, in a way, a kind of apsidal form 
a, a section with an interesting roof, interesting ceiling, which is inflected out, of course, towards the outside, the curtain wall, and the views, tremendous views, towards the rest of Seoul. Uh, and that sequence defines the, the kind of uh, vertical stepping of public spaces. So this um, view of uh, Loggia in Florence is a kind of a nice reference because it's an open, interesting section. And for, we're very fortunate the ambitions of the client uh, are to create variety in each, in each of these special spaces, but still to link them together with a, a thematic coherence, which is not true of every high-rise building. You know, you, you may find that one space up at the top has nothing to do with what's below, but befitting a kind of a corporate headquarters approach, this is the ground floor, uh, double deck ground and mezzanine, and you can see this sort of scoop-like ceiling form. Well, that and the curvature of that, uh, which you see is encased in wood, uh, and seen from the outside creates uh, an interesting sort of shadow box-like uh, depth, uh, would be experienced inside the building at the ground floor here. It's this uh, tremendous sort of vaulted, uh, semi-vaulted space. But then going up in the building, as we go up to the conference center, there is an, an echo of that kind of shape, that sort of material. Or uh, similarly, uh, at the office tell lobby, you know, way up in the midsection of this uh, building, so more than 200 meters up in the air or the hotel ballroom, the intention is uh, that each one of these spaces will receive the same kind of attention. There will be a, a, uh, a, a kind of response, uh, like an echo of what is happening down below. And that takes us all the way up to the top of the building. The elevatoring systems, uh, which Jim Fortune is, is working on, are pretty complex, both from the point of view of uh, uh, vertical transportation, but also of, uh, of uh, fire escape. Actually, some of them used as, as rescue uh, lifts. Uh, the double deckering now becoming a standard part of the repertoire of the super tall building. Uh, and also, I think, very um, gratifying in, in the construction process. This tapered form <coughs> is, has not been uh, uh, the simplest of geometries to work with. Uh, but it, it works in, in many ways for the, uh, for the functioning of the building uh, because uh, the floor plates of residential and hotel tend to be smaller. And, and the structure, actually, very early on, we, we uh, realized there were great efficiencies to linking this whole thing together rather than stepping it uh, in one form. And so the, the details of the curtain wall system will have a similar sort of tapering. So the mullions, which you could see a kind of nested version of uh, mullion plans there, which almost like a piece of asparagus or some kind of natural form that tapers as it goes up, uh, will be cut down into uh, a, basically a telescope, which will appear like a smooth transition as one goes up the building. So all that has been uh, supported in the, uh, the engineering, the design, and uh, the pre-construction phases of the project. Here you can see uh, this um, <clears throat> sort of played out on the, on the exterior of the building in the form of these outrigger mullions. And so that brings me to the end of the, the talk. I just want to say this view uh, from the Han River looking south is a very telling view because in a way this, tell, this shows us the beginning of the project, not the final realization. If we think back to that early image of London and Seoul compressed of the city, as a place where the, super, the role of the super tall building, the future of the super tall building, as, is as a kind of tent post where the tent hasn't been built yet. The, the, the fabric's not there. The other buildings have not yet grown in. And the 20 story soldier like buildings of residential, which were built uh, around the time of the Olympics, maybe a little before and a little after, but you know, perfectly fine neighborhood, but the opportunities to fill in with density where the tall building leads the way uh, to achieve the kind of urban environment that, that Jamshil, this uh, what will become critical uh, neighborhood of Seoul, can aspire to, that one could, one could say in an urban design, in an urban planning sense, is the ultimate role and the future of the tall building in Seoul. Thank you. Excellent. James, thank you. Uh, questions? I, I have I have one. 
Um, you know, I'm curious about the impact. It, you, you focused on the, the, the urban setting, the urban environment, which I think was excellent. Thank you for doing that. Um, my question is, what, what effects did it have on the existing infrastructure, and were there things that needed to happen uh, design-wise and you know, eventually that would be um, implemented that would respond to the demand of the thousands of people that will, will live and work uh, in, the, in the building? Well, the, 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 there's a, a little bit of a, uh, an advantage that the Lotte uh, client enjoys there in that they own a number of the, the properties surrounding the site and have an influence on, for example, the lake park to the south and so the street to the south of the site which is not now a main artery, but, but is very important for, to absorb the kind of traffic, and also the pedestrian uh, sort of outdoor flow and the recreational use of the tower, where do people spill out into uh, to use the park and enjoy uh, the afternoon or, or whatever. Those are areas which, which Lotte has uh, some control over, and then working with the city, uh, and we actually play a not a, a, a super huge role in a lot of that negotiation um, uh, that falls to Sohan, the architect of the, the base, and to uh, Chung Myon Lee and his group at BOM. Uh, so there, there has been a tremendous kind of a, a, and long, long term uh, process of discussion. But I would say, you know, on the whole, from our point of view, working a little bit more locally in, in the site and immediate surrounding buildings, uh, the open space issue. Of, of how how to absorb all of these people is something that there's it's not the tightest of urban sites. This is not building uh, downtown central Hong Kong or um, you know even Kowloon or some of the other sites that, that we work on. Uh, but but the actual infrastructural issues are better speak with uh, Jung Myon after the the meeting to uh, get a little better uh, history of that. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I don't see one. Thank you very much, Thanks. James. Excellent presentation. <laughs>